Where I come from, the multiverse theory isn't even entertained as a theory. It's taught as a fundamental aspect of the inner workings of the many planes of existence. In particular, there is a day of the year, well, a day or two, where the actual veils of our universes grow thinner. During the month of All Hollow, in which these days land, negative energy beings can be spotted on occasion, especially when the positive energetic waves of our star, Solaris, wanes, giving way to night. Many such creatures were labelled as demons, spectres, ghosts, and other such night creatures. This period of time in your universe is derivatively punctuated by a holiday you call Halloween, the month where the most interesting things happen, for better or for worse. The current year here isn't worth mentioning, but where you are, it's either mid-2021 or mid-2022. <laughs> Chronomancy isn't my strong suit and my parents didn't bother to hire Chrono Magus to tutor me. I can tell you that the day and night cycle here is similar to Earth 1, 12, and 42, that being roughly 24 hours in a day with about 12 hours of daylight. Technology isn't as widespread here, but through an enchantment or two, a decent thaumaturgic terminal, and a proxy, I'm able to catch a clear signal into one of the many versions of Earth. It was an old friend of mine that taught me how to do this and pretty much all the parts and components involved are straight from the black magic market. You see, I don't make my own spells, and I'm not that good at even the simplest of spells commonly found in a beginner's manual. Scholars here says that it depends on the season and the time of day slash night in which a person is born that determines their capacity and aptitude for spellcasting, crafting, or even enchanting. Every middle schooler where I'm from is already taught that when you are born, it has a different effect on your life, due to certain realities being closer to us on the day of our birth. I happened to be born just a little too late, and it was considered a tragedy, as I was supposed to have been born when a particularly rare reality had connected. Oh well, missed it by a few minutes, but that was enough for me to be born practically inept at magic in a rather peculiar way. There's something significant about All Hollow. Uh, well, let's use the term you're more familiar with. On Halloween month, normally stable enchantments and spells become a bit more unstable, or even more unpredictable. In case of curses, well, most sane people wouldn't dare to intentionally cast or craft a curse during this month. Curses are very much a part of how I came into my own, and in my own way. As a rather muscular friend of mine used to say, magic isn't everything. Though, leading scholars vehemently disagree with that statement, so I just tell them that he meant it figuratively. The way I discovered what I was best at, or rather, what I grew to be passionate enough about to become the best at it, was the time I suffered my first curse. That now, there are various types of curses, and plenty of different ways to cast a curse, but the very first curse I became cursed with was one which affected luck. Now, I'm a man with quite a few freckles on my body, more than what any sane person could even imagine counting. The curse was placed on one of my freckles, and placed on me by my grandmother, no less. She stated, For as long as that freckle remains on your body, I curse your life to be filled with twice as many curses as the average village idiots. Then she promptly dropped dead and withered on the spot. That curse really must have taken the last of what little life she had left. Curses are funny that way, and some even say that people like me have a natural defense against curses, something that keeps a curse from hitting us as hard as it should. Bollocks, that's what I say to that. That old hag was miffed that my birth had ruined my family's once prestigious name. Joke's on her, as I brought back at least half of that renown in my first 24 years of life. Now now, I understand that folks here take a shine to predominantly creepy or unsettling tales, and I've been through more than my fair share of the spooky side of life. However, I'd like to start my life story somewhere closer to the beginning. There's plenty of time to get into the dark and twisted details later. I mean, you can't have a world as lousy with curses and magic as my world, and seriously expect everything to be fun in games 370 days of the year. Yes. Probably more or less days than that on your calendar. 
Now, my second encounter with curses. There was this time that I put on two doubly cursed rings at once. Ring one can't be removed, and it speeds healing, but when worn too long it causes fatal blood clots. Ring two also can't be removed, and it improves the wearer's reaction speed, movement, and thought speeds, but when worn too long it causes the blood to thin so much that the wearer dies of exsanguination. When worn together, I heal a bit faster, and I'm a bit quicker than before. Plus, the rings are indestructible, which saved my hand long enough for someone to actually come along and lift that rune powered tractor off of it. Do I see Maxident Pro? Actually, quite the opposite. I'm very careful, or I always used to be. All of that is basically saying that I don't need bandages for as long, and my bruises go away a bit quicker. Sounds cool, but in reality, it's meh. Oh, the tractor. I got it for free from some shady looking merchant passing through town. It's a standard tractor from your universe, adapted to work in mine. Probably not the smartest move on my part, but hey, it's free stuff. I realize you may know of runes and such in fiction and folklore, and it's not too different from that really. They serve as metaphysical circuits. The precise shape of the rune and the quality of tuning crystals used shape exactly what effect you may expect, assuming you made it correctly. <laughs> Do forgive me for making it sound as simple as formatting an Excel spreadsheet. It's actually twice as stressful. You see, Excel doesn't blow your hands off if you format it incorrectly. More interesting is the third encounter with curses. The next time I came across cursed objects, I was swimming, trying out my new necklace of water breathing I bought of a hedge witch. They deal mostly in arcane formulae passed on through familial generations. If you asked me how this particular trinket works, well, that would take a bit of the fantasy away from the rest of my story. But it's my habit to reveal such things when I remember to. Something like a necklace of water breathing works by creating a sonic field which vibrates at just the right frequency to cause the jawbones of the wearer to emit a constant hydrophobic wave of inaudible sound. You see, normal oxygen is free to move inward, it gets more complicated the more I explain, so we'll leave it at that for now. The hedge witch told me it was five copper, and so I went to pay her five copper, but she changed her mind, raising it to ten copper. The tax said five! Anyway, I put my five copper on the counter and walked out with the necklace. She shouted something, and I shouted back, It's bad business to cheat your customers. And it turns out the necklace curses the wearer to sink like a stone. Now, I can also explain this one, but I won't do this all the time, I swear. The curse basically boosts the area of effect to envelop the whole body. It's a miracle that it doesn't usually cause all the water to leave a person's body. This makes it nearly impossible for the average person to swim. Still works for the water breathing, but I couldn't get out the pool. <laughs> While at the bottom of the deep end, I found a perfectly functioning bracelet of beginner swimming. It's a charm which sends weak pulse of energy to the muscles typically activated when swimming. Novice swimmer bracelets were cheap and common. This one must have costed around five whole silver coins. Something must have been wrong with it as well, for the moment I slipped on it I started gulping in huge amounts of water into my lungs. Or I would have, had I not been wearing the necklace of water breathing, if I didn't have this water breathing necklace, even though it's cursed, I surely would have died. By now, you've likely noticed that weekly enchanted goods are fairly easy to get and quite cheap. This delightful fact is easily countered by the fact that curses are easier to cast, last longer, and often have unintended side effects. Picture it this way. You can't afford to enchant your new adventuring gear at a legitimate enchantery, so you figure you'll have to find a hedge mage to do the same work at half price. Only he doesn't know the proper techniques, right frequency ranges, uses a subpar or flawed tuning crystals to excite and modulate the particles and quantum properties of the objects he's tinkering with. Worst case scenario for him, he explodes or gets banished to the void between worlds. Worst case for you, the botched enchantment, or curse, could simply turn you inside out, hopefully killing you in the process. The cheapest ones, when done well, barely affect you at all. 
and the most expensive ones are actually banned in most professional athletic sports. We do have magic-assisted sports as well, but even then they implemented a strict spell code which prohibits the use of human sacrifice, willing or otherwise, or animal sacrifice exceeding one cow or 15 chickens, just for example. We do have... Um, less legal sports in some shadier parts of some cities. Politicians have been unofficially known to have their palms greased to look the other way. In some cases. Anyway. The bracelet, which was heavily offset by the cursed necklace, allowed me to swim as if I'd been training a few months longer than I already have. So, I swam out and thanked my lucky stars. Not long after that occasion, I began to take my great-grandmother's curse more seriously, and I took to consuming large volumes of arcane literature, consulting well-known and greatly respected theorists in the finer, more solid assumptions of how magic works, especially in the cases of curses, unbreakable ones, and ones only thought to be unbreakable. A highly debated topic amongst arcane scholars. And that's the story of how I, Beryllius Venerus, started on my journey to later become known as the Curse Crasher. I wrote a book on counter curses, detailing how, though no known healing spells or countermeasures are known that can destroy a curse, curses can be balanced out by carefully placed counter curses. It's all in my book. Well, why don't I read some of it for you? Oh, if you have the time, that is. If not, you're more than welcome to come back any time. Uh, you do have the time? Excellent! Grab your favorite drink, perhaps a snack, and get comfy. Here, in this book, is a list of people people, and a detailed account of their curses, including how I helped each one of them. In this book, I have 100 witness testimonials written in the style of an autobiography. Case 001, The Boy Who Jumps Too High. This story is a retelling of how I chanced upon a village beset by many curses bestowed as either blessings or punishments by their tyrannical wizard king Arlen. It was one week travelling from my hometown of Elkfield to reach this quaint kingdom of Arlantia. Upon arriving, I purchased a room in the first tavern I could find with a decent ale, and one where the birds didn't spontaneously shock you awake every hour on the hour. I didn't know what a-hole goes about hexing so many odd objects, but I aim to find out someday. It didn't take me long to find a villager with a problem, as our Lancia was lousy with them. Sheesh! I thought I had a run of bad luck, but this place? Toilets with warming seats that BURN YOUR ASS if you don't shit fast enough. Steak knives that were sharpened with the wrong magics, causing the handles to be imperceptibly sharper than the blade. And that's just the start. An hour after I set out into the center of the city, I came across a spectacle. A boy that was hanging onto the ledge of a clock tower at the center of the bazaar. The clock tower was at least two bonds high. I called out to a nearby merchant. You there, kindly cheese merchant. Is that boy trying to kill himself? Did he slip? I don't see any stairs or ladders leading up there. The cheese merchant glanced at me, then back to the boy. Nah, that's Jeffrey. The boy what our king asked for a blessing on his birthday. The idiot asked to make him jump higher. Well, he can indeed jump higher, but at the look of it, it's always higher than he means to. The cheese merchant chuckled. Yeah, exactly double how high he intends to jump. Real problem in this landing. Broke his arm, sprained his leg one time last year, trying to impress my daughter. He fell that far. Nah, I broke his arm, thrown him out of our house. Well, as far as I can tell, he takes normal damage from falls, if that's what you're wondering. Just then, the boy's hand slipped, nearly causing him to fall. Thinking quickly, I dashed to the nearest witch's yurt, asking her for any charm allowing for fall protection. She had three, and surprisingly, only two were cursed. I'll take those two cursed ones. The witch stared at me, confused. What? You don't want to try and pick the one that isn't cursed? I might have given it to you. No thanks, but could you tell me what each of these curses do? As long as you pay me first. Deal. Now what do they do? 
She explained that the cape with the green charm curses the wearer to seek out whatever dangerous situations, and the cape with the red charm causes the wearer to be unable to jump at all. Thanks. Here's your coin. Beware, for the wearers of the charms will suffer a terrible cur- Thanks, but I think we're past that point, kind witch. Wait, let me guess. The cape is indestructible and can't be removed. Yep, and yep. Force of habit. Come again sometime. I, myself, having an intense fear of heights, thought it'd be best to choose the cape with the green charm, so I donned the cape with the green charm before attempting to scale the tall tower. Now relieved of my large portion of my previous fear, though not entirely, I was able to climb the tower with mild trepidation. Upon reaching the top, I quickly discuss the terms with the boy. He hesitates briefly, then accepts, as I swiftly equip him with the cape bearing the red charm, and we both jumped. The crowd screamed as we plummeted down, yet a moment before hitting the ground, we both gradually slowed to a feather's falling speed. Yes! The crowd cheered, and the boy brought me back to his parents' house to discuss the news of our deal, rather than stick around and take several comely villagers up on their offers of free ale and supper. That's right, I begin to tell Jeffrey's parents. As long as Jeffrey keeps his cape on, he will be able to jump at roughly half of his intended jumping height. Now, go ahead, impress your parents, Jeffrey. Tell them what I told you. Jeffrey beamed, his parents waiting nervously to hear what he'd learned. As long as I always over estimate my jumping by double, I'll jump exactly as high as I mean to. He demonstrated by nearly smacking his head on a wooden support beam overhead and softly landing on the stone floor. Again, he was practically smiling from ear to ear. His parents were overjoyed and not at all displeased by my two reasonable conditions. As payment, I'll ask you for one cursed object you may own, not including the cape I gave Jeffrey, and that you may pay my boarding fees the first day of the month whenever I come into this town. They agreed and sent me on my way with many thanks. What did they give me? An old pair of glasses, cursed to make the wearer go cross-eyed. Odd, but not out of place among some of the stranger curses I've seen. I stayed in that town for a few more weeks without further incident, but soon after leaving, I was later told that Jeffrey suffered a terrible fate. See, he tried working out a similarly clever way of exploiting curses, trying to copy my approach, but... The difference was that he didn't have my personal experience and years of curse-specific study. Jeffrey had intentionally found a set of cursed anklets of leaping, and without understanding the complex processes behind carefully pairing enchanted items, the poor boy executed an impossibly high leap to try and catch a bit of cloud in its bottle for his girlfriend. He shot upwards at breakneck speeds, and in his case, it broke his spine and his neck. And... <sighs> Jeffrey was dead. For his body gently landed next to his horrified love. I was 21 then. When I experienced what I considered to be the first death I truly felt responsible for. And that experience colored the rest of my adventures causing me to consider the dangers of folks trying to figure out how to do what I do. I've 99 more accounts in this book, my fine people. But for now, I must bid you good day. My cursed bed is calling me to sleep. Literally, it won't shut up around this time of day unless I go unmake it and make it again. <laughs> Was this a bit shorter than you expected? No worries, I... Aurelius the Curse Crusher have got you covered. There are plenty more stories from my travels waiting to be requested. And it just so happens that I do have a truly unsettling encounter coming up in my next case. Goodbye. Until next time.